It's very nice of you to be here today. Uh, I'd like to ask some questions. How many people here are, have visited the Middle East? And uh, do we have any Arabic-speaking people here? And that's the great shame in America that we don't have more Arabic-speaking people. We need to have more people understand and speak the Arab language and understand the cultures because it's very difficult. Um, uh, I want to warn you, and uh, I also warn you that I'm at that miserable age where you can't see glasses, so I'll be folding them on and off. But I, I'm quite enthusiastic about what went right and what went wrong in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, not because I'm an ardent uh, Brognathian militarist, but the fact is that this country has spent billions and billions of dollars upon its defense establishment, and we could have gotten over there and found that we had a bunch of rotten legs and sour apples that didn't work. The truth is we got over there and things worked very well, and I'll, I'll have a tendency to use words like remarkable and admirable and incredible and so forth a lot. You can sort of discount those because that's just my general enthusiasm. One of the book reviewers who wrote about the book said I was starry-eyed over gold plate weapon systems. And I'll tell you the truth, I am starry-eyed. Think about it for a minute. Here we are in Washington, D.C. We've got a football team. We have athletes that earn 11, 12, 15 million, 19 million dollars a year. And we go crazy if they catch a pass. I mean, we're really At the same time, we've got young men and women operating at supersonic speeds, uh, flying uh, in hostile enemy territory, engaging uh, enemies, dropping bombs with the greatest precision in the world, avoiding damage, collateral damage, and they're getting paid maybe $75,000 a year. Nobody, nobody stands up and cheers, or they, we do in general, but they don't get the same mass following. So if we put it in perspective, we have really a professional team working for us, and if I'm, I'm, I'll be enthusiastic today in their, their cheerleader. Um, we're going to talk about what went right, and a lot went right. We're going to talk about what went wrong. Some things went wrong. But most of all, I think what we're going to talk about the technology and the people. Now, the nation in 1941 reacted strongly to a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. We maintained a hot, burning indignation for four years. Yet we suffered fewer casualties at Pearl Harbor than we did on 9-11. And Pearl Harbor was some 2,400 miles to the west of us. It wasn't right in our heart. The terrorists uh, uh, attacked New York and Washington, D.C., and would have attacked the White House if they had been able to. Unlike the Japanese, uh, the terrorists also had issued a declaration of war before and after and since 9-11. There's no doubt about their intentions, for they've all been explicit. While the 9-11 attack brought a new sense of vulnerability to the people, I want you to think just for a moment, we're at ground zero even I know it's a beautiful building, we're in the basement, perhaps, but uh, we're at ground zero for the next real big terrorist attack. But this sense of vulnerability seemed to have a time limit for some people, especially people running for office. They began to ignore it. The most important thing about the terrorist attack on 9-11, though, is it presaged the use of much more dangerous weapons, nuclear bombs, dirty bombs, and biological weapons. Now, this isn't speculation, this is not a guess. This is what they've told us they will do if they possibly can. This is what we're trying to combat. Now, uh, as a result of this, we've had to scrap, to scrap past practices. Uh, we've got to move, we have moved to wars of preemption. A lot of criticism of this. But given the nature of their fanaticism, the terrors either have to be hunted down and killed or imprisoned or some otherwise dissuaded from doing it. Because otherwise, if we do not, we will have a, a major uh, attack upon us. There are a limited number of terrorists in the world. They're, they're not vast in number. It's not like you know a Soviet Union of 230 million or 40 million people that, that are opposing us. But the terrorist resources are huge because they are backed either passively for the most part, but actively in some cases by a population of 1.5 billion Muslims that stretch in a belt from Algeria to Indonesia and the Philippines and are found in every country in the world. Now, most of those people are, have no intention of supporting the terrorists, but enough do that it's a problem for us, that we must marshal our resources. Terrorism threat is global, and we have to marshal our resources to fight it. The military victory in Iraqi freedom may have given us the key, perhaps the only key, to an ultimate victory, the democratization of Iraq, Iran, and other, Afghanistan, and others. It'll be difficult to do. There are a lot of hazards. But it must be done, whatever the cost. Success in Iraq could lead to a new domino effect. We talked about the domino effect during the Vietnam War, uh, uh, being positive for the communist world. This could be a domino effect that could be po positive for the democratic world. Iran is ripe for uh, democratization. Pressure could be applied elsewhere. 
And we'll sort of conclude on that note because that's what all of this should be about. I, I want you to share with you that the uh, war in uh, Iraq raised us to a new level of national power. I don't think we really understand it. Most people don't understand the uh, degree of power that we have. The United States possesses more usable power now than it ever did before. When it had depended upon nuclear weapons, it was, of course, vastly powerful. But they were not useful because we, we had the potential for retaliation by the Soviet Union. And fortunately, both the Soviet Union and the United States were smart enough not to engage in it. But today, we have immense power that we can use with surgical precision anywhere in the world almost instantly. It's of an order of magnitude never been seen before. It's not like uh, the Romans and the Gauls. It's not like the British over the French. It's not like Germany over Poland. It's orders of magnitude difference. There's no ally, there's no enemy that can compete with us in this power. Uh, this causes some difficulties because with our coalition partners, we can't, we're not really interoperable anymore. We have to make concessions. We have to make adjustments so that they can operate with us. And I guess the bright side of this, for one thing, is that the wealth of our technology has taken us to a point that we're only about 10% of the way up to the maximum amount of power that we'll have. It's really an incredible situation. And we, as a word, incredible again, but it is. It's remarkable that all of these funds channeled into this thing could have produced the results that they produce. Now, there's been a lot of talk over the years about revolution in military affairs, and there may have been some other revolution in military affairs. This is the first true revolution in military affairs in the 20th century and 21st century, and it is absolute. Now, there was also established by this revolution in military affairs something that without much fanfare has occurred, and that's a revolution in diplomatic affairs. I think you'll see that Libya is the first example of this. Libya, Colonel Gaddafi, smart guy, he's seen the light. He saw what happened in Iraq. He knows it could happen in Libya. He's making a decision that he's going to adhere to the request for nonproliferation. And you'll see more of this and going on. Now, this is a diplomatic result of this massive military power. Well, how did we get this demonstration of massive military power? Um, the first was by t obtaining complete air dominance and complete information dominance. Air dominance means that you suppress the enemy air force and you suppress the enemy ground forces. And in today's terms, it means you suppress them on the first day. You don't, and it's not attrition warfare. We don't go in and shoot down a thousand of their airplanes and they shoot down a hundred of ours. We go in and shoot all their airplanes down and they don't shoot any of ours. That's the ideal situation and that's the way it should be in every war that we fight. Im information dominance, not quite the same thing. It's more difficult. We were able to do it in Iraq with some facility because Iraq was not well organized and because we had been surveying them for 10 years with the operation Northern Watch and Southern Watch. But in other wars and other countries, we'll have to have the same sort of information dominance. This, this is perhaps more challenging than the air dominance. But we did have it. Now here's some things that made the campaign in Iraq unusual. The coalition forces took care to minimize collateral damage. Very few times in warfare have countries gone to war and deliberate attempts been made to really safeguard the enemy population and the enemy infrastructure. There's a possibility that this might have been a mistake. There's a possibility that the Arab mind is the one that uh, respects power and that we might have given an indication that we were weak by doing this. I, I hope that's not the case. In any event, it was the policy and it worked well. Minimum damage was done to an already fragile infrastructure. The campaign was executed swiftly, efficiently, and accepting a lot of risks. There were many, many risks. Had the Iraqis fought with more tenacity, had they been better equipped, had they been better led, some things might have happened. But so complete was our confidence of our people in our information dominance and in our air power that uh, the risks were accepted. We fought an intelligent war too. We fought a war that was used in many ways called what is called effects-based operations. Effects-based operations mean that instead of, for example, if you're attacking a ground defense system, instead of going in and attacking every radar site, every missile site, every airfield, you go in and you take out the command and control centers, the power grids and so forth that effectively dismantle them so that they're not useful. Uh, you, you use fewer sorties, you have fewer aircraft at risk, you have fewer casualties, you do less damage. It's a very intelligent way to fight a war. Um, fortunately for us, and unfortunately for them, or perhaps in the long run, fortunately for them, the Iraqi army was inept. And it was inept for a number of reasons. One is that Saddam deliberately would not train them because he feared a powerful army. He thought that an army 
that is well-trained uh, could well turn against him, and he's quite right. I'm sure that's the case. There are instances that...